Trust and reciprocity are vital processes for the functioning of society, both economically as well as interpersonally. What I'd like to talk to you about today is how social emotions can play a very valuable role in trust and reciprocity, how these emotions can lead us to make good and bad decisions sometimes, and how by looking at the brain, we can get some interesting insights into how these processes actually work. So social emotions are powerful and important in society. You look at the lady behind me, she's standing on one of those rare Dutch sunny summer's days. She's in a beautiful Dutch flat landscape and she has a perfectly nice ice cream cone she's about to eat. But you may detect that she looks kind of sad, maybe even a little bit angry. So you might wonder, why is this the case? Well, when I show you her companion, it might become <laughs> immediately obvious. So her little ice cream cone suddenly looks kind of pathetic now compared to this traffic cone of goodness that her, uh, her uh, partner's about to, or is al already eating. So I think this illustrates something really important about social emotions, that we spend a lot of our time comparing ourselves to others, we think about others, and we think about what they're thinking about us. So these are powerful emotions, and they turn out to play a very strong role in our social decisions. So this is an example um, of where social emotions led to uh, a significant impact on decision making. So several years ago in the US, there was a, a single winner of a very large lottery jackpot. Um, a single winner was about to collect $128.6 million. Behind me, this is exactly $1 million, so you can imagine. A room full of piles of cash. It's a lot of money. Now, um, what was interesting about this situation is that normally, of course, the winner collects immediately. Someone rushes forward with their lottery ticket, uh, within hours usually. But in this situation, a day went by, nobody showed up. Two days, no winner. Four days, still nobody had claimed this, this money. And this became a big story, it was in the media. And finally, uh, eight days went by, still nobody had shown up. Now, the two things about the Michigan State Lottery that turn out to be important for explaining this non-appearance of our lucky winner. One is that you're not allowed to remain anonymous, so you will be publicized in the newspapers and on TV as the winner. And the second, what turns out to be the more important reason in this case, is the place you purchased the ticket is also going to be publicized and featured in the newspapers. And unfortunately for our winner in this case, um, they bought the ticket <laughs> and a slightly uh, unsalubrious establishment. So what the newspapers politely refer to as a, an adult bookstore, which apparently can sell <laughs> lottery tickets in Michigan for some reason. So I mean, this is a good example of where a social emotion of shame, embarrassment, guilt led this person to risk losing the entire jackpot. And in fact, it cost him, and it was a him, um, about $52,000 in lost interest. So we could argue this is a case where a social emotion leads us to make at least a financially bad decision. The winner eventually showed up after nine days, uh, just so you know. So social emotions influence our decision. I've shown here an example of where this leads to a bad decision. And I'm sure we all have examples of where embarrassment or shame led us to either do things we didn't want to do or more likely prevented us from doing something we actually wanted to do. I'm sure you all remember the time you really wanted to do karaoke but were too embarrassed to do so. Maybe that's just me. But, so these are powerful emotions. They can, they can hurt our decision making, but they can also help our decision making. And um, there's certain times where emotions can lead us to do the, the right thing and make a generous, what we call a pro-social decision. So we study this experimentally using a selection of uh, economic games. So I want to tell you about one of the games we use and the results we find. So let's imagine you're one of our participants and we're going to pair you up with Jason in this game called the Trust Game. So Jason is a, a stranger to you, but he's a real person. And the rules of the game are this. First, we give Jason a sum of money. So in this case, we give Jason 10 euro. And we tell Jason that he has the opportunity to invest some of this money with you. And in return, he has a chance that he might get some return on that investment later on. So Jason decides what to do, and Jason's a generous soul. So he decides to do the following. He's going to keep two euro for himself, and he's going to send eight euro to you. Now, we have a little experimental trick here. And the rules are, whatever Jason sends to you, we multiply by four. So now Jason, or sorry, now you have 32 euros in front of you, and Jason knows this in advance. And now you have a difficult decision to make, and this is the decision we ask our subjects to make. You have the opportunity to give some money back to Jason, but importantly, you don't have to. So you can choose to take all the money and leave immediately, never encountering Jason again. You can have a little spending spree, which are 32 euro. You're perfectly free to do that. Or you can give money back to Jason 
remembering that he's trusted in you. So the question we ask our subjects in this experiment is simply how much of this 32 euro, any amount, you want to return to Jason? So what would you do? So is there anybody here who would just say thank you and take all 32 euro? You can raise your hand, it's okay. It's a, <laughs> it's a safe setting. So there's a few people up there. Um, so you can, you can introspect and figure, what would I do in this situation? I don't know Jason. I don't really have a, a legal obligation. I can take the money and run, or I can repay. So economic models turn out to be rather um, depressing in terms of what they predict. And they predict that people return basically nothing. Why would you ever give money to somebody when you don't have to? But when we actually uh, observe people in this experiment, they're actually quite generous. Uh, most people will give about half of the money back. They'll kind of willingly give 16 euro to Jason when they don't have to. So this is a puzzle. This is a puzzle for economics. So why would, ever, why would you ever give money to someone if you don't have to? So this is a, a situation where psychology and neuroscience can potentially help address this. So there's two possible reasons for this uh, puzzle, um, reasons for reciprocity. One is a kind of a warm glow account. You give money to Jason because it feels good. You feel good, Jason feels good, everybody feels good, the world feels good. It's a very kind of happy feeling. Now, an alternate account is one that, as an Irish Catholic, I feel very well qualified to, uh, to investigate, and that's the notion of guilt that the reason we give money to Jason isn't because it feels good, but because it feels bad not to give. If I don't give money to Jason, this 32 euro will be kind of hanging in my pocket like a millstone forever. Now, of course, these are motivations that look the same behaviorally. We both, in both cases, people give money back. So how can we distinguish between them? And this is a situation where we can use neuroscience and we can scan people's brains while playing this task to try and get a better sense of what the motivations actually are. So we do this experiment where we place people in an MRI scanner, we have them play this game, and when they're at the point of reciprocating trust, they're deciding to give money back, we see what parts of the brain are active. And it turns out, interestingly, that um, parts of the brain that we know are involved in kind of negative emotional processing and figuring out what people expect of us turn out to be most predictive of reciprocation. So we seem to be motivated by the more negative guilt emotion than the more positive pro-social emotion. And these are useful pieces of information for us to better understand trust and reciprocity. So where does this leave us? Well, economic models of behavior often fail because they um, typically don't incorporate social motivations into their models. They don't uh, fo focus on the factors I've talked about in trying to predict behavior. So the message is this, social motivations are important if we want to understand why we do what we do. If we really want to try and build economic and policy models that, that better describe and explain trust and reciprocity, we need to incorporate these social, models, these social motivations. And when we can do this, we'll be able to develop better models of policy that can better predict and explain how and when we trust and reciprocate. Thank you very much.